Our final speaker uh, tonight is uh, Ralph Nader. Um, I differ only slightly with my uh, fellow lawyers and, and academics in describing uh, Ralph as, as a public interest lawyer um, and advocate, uh, because I think his importance in, in history and in uh, the development of American society is more broad gauge than that. To introduce Ralph, I want to, um, I want to uh, direct your attention to a, a small town in the Loire Valley in France, with the town of Amboise, in, at which there still stands the, the Chateau d'Amboise, and connected to that by an underground tunnel is, the, is a, a, a minor chateau called the Clos Lucet, which is where um, Leonardo da Vinci, in the last years of his life, lived. And he lived there at the, uh, the insistence of the King of France, Francis I, who brought da Vinci, because he, not only because he was a patron of the arts, but because he wanted da Vinci's ideas on, on technology, history, art. Uh, da Vinci was a, a, a Renaissance humanist and uh, had an enormous influence on many fields. Uh, mathematics, engineering, geology, astronomy, cartography, even paleontology and architecture. He actually, he was credited with the inventions of the parachute, the helicopter, the tank, and uh, he was uh, discussing all of these with, with the, the king of, of France, Francis I. Now, the analogy between Ralph and Leonardo da Vinci is, is, is uh, there's somewhat of a distinction in that Ralph has, has not been as well received in the corridors of power as Leonardo da Vinci was in the 16th century. But in another respect, Ralph is every bit as much of a, of a humanist and forward thinker as Leonardo da Vinci, whereas da Vinci recognized the importance of technology in advancing humankind, Ralph, early on in the, in the, the, the 20th century, he understood the importance of preventing harm to humans from technological so-called progress, and that part of advancing technology is also protecting humans and civil society from uh, technological problems. So, in that sense, Ralph's contribution to America are more broad gauge. He's not only an attorney, he's also, he's a nonfiction author, he's a, a, a novelist, he's an activist, he's a journalist, he's a TV reporter and commentator, he's a professor, he's a speaker, he's an organizer, he's probably America's best assignment editor, he's a founder of dozens of citizen groups, he's an inventor of his own profession, consumer advocacy, he's a presidential candidate, and I don't think he's missed putting out a, um, an, a, a news column, an opinion column, in 50 years on a weekly basis. Um, he's even a working comedian, having hosted uh, Saturday Night Live, although in a rare moment of immodesty, his friends and staff agreed that he was not as funny on that segment as he thinks he was. <laughs> That's not even to mention that Ralph was the moving force be some, behind some of the most important legislation of the 20th century, including the, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and the Motor Vehicle Safety Act, which is estimated has saved the lives of three million Americans. The French have, an, have a phrase for, for uh, men like Ralph, uh, which is, même mem l'idée de Ralph me fatigue. Translation, the very idea of Ralph tires me out. He is so energetic and uh, uh, broad-gauged in his, in his uh, efforts to uh, uh, protect American society and advance American democracy that in, in many ways, in, in future historians, I think, will say that, that Ralph is sort of an amalgam of the forward-thinking genius of da Vinci, the public institution building of Benjamin Franklin, and the great advocate for separation of powers and it checks on tyranny, Thomas Jefferson. He's actually more than that, he's, he's sui generis, he is uh, Americans, America's leading public citizen. If there is a more important living American I do not know <coughs> of that person, please uh, join me in, in standing and uh, recognizing Ralph Nader and thanking him for this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, those comments. Obviously, when you look around this uh, historic hall, 
Obviously, uh, your remarks are not exactly requited, uh, Carl. Uh, we've just had eight uh, hours of wonderful presentations by accomplished advocates uh, reflecting the theme of the day, which is recognizing the law of torts and the civil justice system, defending yourself. And I want to make a few remarks under the rubric of getting serious about restoring tort law and its availability for wrongfully injured uh, people. At the uh, beginning uh, of the um, American Museum of Tort Law entrance, there is a statement by uh, the great jurist Learned Hand, and the statement is, if we're to have a democracy, thou shalt not ration justice. Thou shalt not ration justice. That should be a cardinal principle inviolable, it's being violated every day, especially by giant corporations and their government allies. What we're seeing here with the tort deform, when you start thinking about it, the atrocity can hardly be overestimated. Instead of contending in the courts of law under strict evidential requirements, uh, refereed by the judge who disciplines the jury, subject to appellate review, open to all people to come to the court, open to the press, the corporatists want to play a very vicious game. They want to sidestep contending in court, and they want to win by campaign cash greasing of lawmakers in state legislatures all over the country, who then pass laws that from an absentee position, tie the hands of judges and juries all over the state who are the only ones who hear, see, and evaluate the evidence in each individual case. That gives new meaning to playing dirty. They're not willing to contend on the merits, they contend on cash bribes to receiving legislature, legislators. Here's how it plays out. There's a little boy who fell out of a tree in California, and a branch of a, the tree went through his nose to his brain. His mother, as a nurse, rushed him to the hospital. The, the doctors looked him over, uh, didn't really examine him with a CAT scan, that was the proper procedure, and sent him back home with some Tylenol, and in a couple days, he convulsed with permanent brain damage. The parents were faced with a total lifetime of supporting this child. They were extremely compassionate parents. They went to court. They won a $7.5 million verdict. But under California micro law, greased by the doctor's lobby in 1976, with Jerry Brown being the governor, they put a cap of $250,000 lifetime for pain and suffering. The judge dismissed the jury who thought they did a fair job with their $7.5 million verdict, and then basically said to the court, I am required by the micro law of California to reduce it $250,000. Over the years, I've been in touch with Governor Jerry Brown. In 1992, he issued a statement saying he made a mistake signing the micro law, that it enriched the insurance companies and harmed innocent plaintiffs, and it should be repealed. He becomes governor several years ago, with two thirds of the legislature being members of his party. I got in touch with him and I said, well, here's your statement from the early 90s. Should we, shouldn't we expect a repeal of MICRA? He said, well, I'm, I'm tied up with this huge budget deficit I'm trying to correct. Give me a little time. It'll happen. It hasn't happened. He's tried every excuse imaginable. He said, why, why don't the uh, heads of the assembly and the Senate put the bill in? I said, they're all waiting for you to put the bill in. To this day, Thousands of innocent people cannot collect 
more than $250,000 for a lifetime pain and suffering. And as you heard from Lucinda Finley, a lot of them are children, elderly, women. And as a result, most lawyers don't even take these cases. They can't justify it economically. So basically, the, the, the right to go to court is abolished. Now, it's one thing to say that access to justice was inhibited. I like to put it another way. This is official obstruction of justice. It should be a crime, but it isn't. It should be a political liability, but it isn't. It should be moral opprobrium and a stigma on the politicians in Sacramento and other state capitals, but it isn't. And one of the reasons is that we have not educated the public to be as outraged over destruction of the rights of people's physical safety and reputational probity to the extent that we have educated the public on a lot of other things of much lesser significance. Breaking through power means resuscitating and expanding the law of torts. The reason why tort lawyers can be vilified is not only because the vilifiers are well connected to their own media, to the mass media, to the politicians, but it's because these tort lawyers are about all we have left in one community after another to take on power, to break power, especially commercial, corporate power. And they simply can't handle the load if we ever utilize the tort system. There would have to be many, many tort lawyers. And they take it on a contingent fee, which means that there are a lot of cases they can't take because it's too expensive to try to prove causation from a toxic exposure to a cancer and a designated plaintiff. What we need to do is start thinking in new and, and bolder ways. Here's one proposal. The corporate attorneys get away with this. They're the ones who draft these one-sided fine print contracts that cannibalize in Detroit and destroy the law of wrongful injury. And you heard that brilliantly as espoused by Professor Radin a few minutes ago. The law of torts and the law of contracts were the two pillars of freedom out of medieval England. They were called the two pillars of private law. What that meant is that we didn't have to ask anybody's permission to use them. We could go to a court, we could go and sign a contract or not sign a contract. That was too much freedom for these corporations, for the ideology of corporatism which wants to destroy all civil values that challenge its control or dilute them or divert them or co-opt them. As a result, what we've seen is an impunity by the corporate attorneys themselves. And the opprobrium is almost exclusively applied to trial lawyers who represent wrongfully injured people. And the corporate law firms are called by the media prestigious, the prestigious law firm of Covington and Burling. What's prestigious about it? It represents cutthroat tobacco industry. It represents the gouging drug industry. It has been caught destroying documents and many other nefarious deeds, but it's still called the prestigious law firm of Covington and Burling which now has received former Attorney General Holder back to his office, which they held while he was Attorney General. Here's my suggestion. All attorneys licensed to practice law are offices of the court. They are quasi-official people. They are not just private citizens. What duties do offices of the court have? Our beloved profession has not filled those duties with the level that should be the, the case. Let me fill one duty. When a corporate attorney 
or attorneys as officers of the court put in forced arbitration clauses in fine print contracts on behalf of a certain corporate client on a matter that is before them. They are closing the courtroom door for all the people who deal with American Express, all the people who deal with the Hospital Corporation of America, all the people who deal with some giant housing apartment complex. When they close the door arbitrarily across the board, I believe that is an obstruction of justice. I believe that is a violation of the canons of ethics that should be pursued by the bar regulatory organizations in the 50 states. That's what an officer of the court should be held accountable for. An officer of the court should not work for big fees on behalf of corporations to arbitrarily close the courtroom door to all people, quite apart from the particular case at hand. People they never knew. They're denying them justice. I'm waiting for the first trial lawyers association to, to file a grievance against these lawyers. We're, we're hearing a lot about police, illegal police violence, and prosecutors who don't prosecute. They go to work with them. They're reluctant to prosecute them. It's not a pleasant task. But most people don't know that if their loved one is extinguished by a violent police activity that's illegal, they can file a case under tort law. But some do. And the family of Tamir Rice, the 12-year-old who was shot down uh, in Cleveland, just received a multi-million dollar verdict. Why don't people know that? Why don't more people know that? It's because we're not educating the public. We're not educating them in the schools, the high schools. We have professors who are teaching high school students tax law. You can teach high school students tort law. You can teach colleges the law of torts as part of the liberal arts. And that brings me to our educational purposes. We have about 50,000 practicing trial lawyers in the country. What if they decided that they were going to speak to a total of 1,000 people a year? School assemblies, clubs, different gatherings. It's not that hard to reach 1,000 people when you're living in a community. That means that they could reach 50 million people a year from all ages and backgrounds with their message, which I think is a very powerful message and well documented, as Joanne Dorschel and others have pointed out. They should try to get this as part of the curriculum in the schools. They should try, try to talk about children and parents not only defending themselves from predators, but learning about the law. They can defend themselves from corporate predators, commercial predators, not just street predators. I once spoke with Pam Leopakis, who was a great trial lawyer in New York, worked in the tobacco industry cases. She was head of the American Association of Trial Lawyers. And uh, I asked her, what would you really like to do? And she said, I would like to represent elderly people in medical malpractice cases because they can't get representation. They're not worth enough, given all the expenses of a malpractice case, to be represented. This is a, one example of the gross underutilization of the tort law. It's probably utilized 1% to 2% of the time when it should be utilized all the way. Every wrongful act deserves a legal remedy. <clears throat> I think what, another thing that we should do is ask some of the wealthier lawyers to tithe themselves 1% a year of their fees and establish civic groups in every state defending the legal system. These civic advocacy groups can also enlist the help of plaintiffs uh, who have gotten justice and understand the civil 
justice system. Sometimes you have uh, uh, medical malpractice victims form a group of, uh, of advocates on behalf of uh, trying to prevent medical malpractice. This is a group in Connecticut that has done good work. But in most states, there is a tortfeasors lobby group. It's called Citizens Against Lawsuit Abuse. Instead, we should establish groups to counter them, Citizens for Lawsuit Use. There's one in Texas called Texans for Public Justice that's done a lot of good work and actually got a lot of good media as supported by the trial lawyers. What about all the other states? There comes a critical point when the law of torts is, show, is so shut down that it's irreversible and it can't be restored. And in some states, it's almost reached that point, short of a real mass mobilization. Lawyers should be worried about court budgets. Court budgets are so tight now in California, uh, due in part to Governor Jerry Brown, who's a, a Yale Law grad, and I've called him a self-hating lawyer. They're less than 2% of the California budget. The prison budget is 9%. The prison budget is 9%. Nationwide, that's about what the court budgets are. In Connecticut, a few weeks ago, they shut down two superior courts for lack of budget. We're blowing up countries all over the world, spending trillions of dollars, giving hundreds of billions of dollars to corporate freeloaders and, and tax escapees, and we're shutting down our courts? If we don't have this kind of visceral indignation supported by a massive platform of facts, we're not going to raise the level of urgency to where it must reach. There are also huge procedural obstacles now, thanks to the Supreme Court. So if you have a substantive case, you can't even get into court. They shut you out of the court because you, you're, you're blocked by your procedural obstacle. M a motion to dismiss is now like a summary judgment. You can't even argue your case. <clears throat> there are a lot of other things that lawyers should do. Gag orders. I've never met a trial lawyer that likes confidentiality agreements as a condition of settlement. But they have a priority for their place. So they close down their obligation to, to inform the public of the facts in the case. They're put in a conflict of interest. That should be an unethical practice by a defense corporate lawyer who demands it as a condition of the settlement. That should be an unethical practice, violation of the canons of ethics. We also need lawyers to do what Bill Chernoff has done. His alma mater is Wisconsin Law School. He's, he has set up a consumer law clinic uh, at the law school. So young, young law students can learn about it and make careers out of it. We need more of that. We need wealthier trial lawyers to set up their own foundations so they can supply grants to law students to do rigorous research in many areas for which there is no. Uh, research. All of these can be done uh, with a sense of urgency. All of these can be done with an awareness that it's not enough simply uh, to nurture a few trees in the forest and ignore the dwindling forest and not look at the big picture. And recovering tort law is looking at the big picture. And the trial lawyers have got to do both. They've got to represent the client zealously, those are the trees, but they've got to pay attention to the forest because there may not be any trees after a while. The last points uh, I, I want to make are the issue of impunity and immunity. Tort deform is not just restricting the rights of wrongfully injured people. It's developing actual immunities for corporations, where whole areas now are, are off limits. And nuclear power is a virtual immunity after a few million bucks uh, for the nuclear power plants. If they have a cat catastrophe, the taxpayer makes up uh, the difference. And you see in state after state, little amendments immunizing here and immunizing there. You see it even at the federal level. Uh, sn snuck in a larger, uh, a larger bill. 
immunity is what the corporations really want. It's really strange. The corporate structure was set up to limit the liability of shareholders. And ever since the early 20th century, corporate lobbies have been trying to limit the liability of corporations. A legal fiction, not a human being. The second issue is impunity. This is where if they can't destroy the law of accountability because they carve out an exception for themselves and become immune, they have so much firepower that they, they intimidate law enforcement officials who, who, if they're not politically harassed by Congress or by the White House or by the governor, uh, they don't have the budget to handle a gigantic law firm that can drain a third of their a staff on one case. So that's how they achieve impunity. And that's Wells Fargo. When the government said, well, you know, what do we want to get dragged down for years and use up our uh, legal hours with this giant bank that made in the last quarter $5 billion, billion in profits after taxes? Well, we'll find it $185 million. $185 million for a premeditated crime that they knew about at the highest levels, and no one's demanding their resignation. No one's demanding uh, accountability. So these are the two. Uh, we're, we're destroying, in all kinds of ways, the rule of law. Subordinating it to the rule of raw corporate power and turning the government into a corporate state. These fine print contracts, they can be viewed as private corporate legislatures. When you're fined, when you're fined $35 for a bounce check that costs a buck and a half to the bank, including covering fraud, that's a penalty. And you're entitled to say, did I agree to that? Did I agree when I was malpracticed that uh, I signed to make my rights, a liability, trial by, did I agree to that? We've got to get young people to start asking questions. Where's your evidence? Where's your legal authority? Did I agree to that? That's not that hard to do. You have 50,000 trial lawyers all over the country. Why are they hunkering down with a few exceptions? They know how to argue a case, but more and more, there aren't going to be any trials. Young lawyers now hardly have any trial experience. The judges and the court dockets are so crowded and the budgets are so restricted, and then you have some corporatist judges, they force these lawyers into settlements that they should never have to agree to. This is our heritage. This is our freedom to participate in power, as Marcus Cicero defined freedom. And what are we doing? We can't fill this hall with seats when a comedian, a bunch of dancers can fill this hall with tickets up to 50, 60, 100, $150 a person. We have to get serious, and all we need is just 1% of the population, two and a half million people, to really get serious about their civic obligations and their engaging and strengthening our democracy. We put out a report a few years ago on the Texas trial bar. It was called The Rise, The Fall and Rise, question mark, of the Texas trial bar. About 20 some years ago, the corporations decided to move in on Texas. The tort law was too good. The workers' compensation law was too good. And so they started destroying through legislative enactment and by paying to elect judges the law of torts, and they've succeeded. And the, the good trial lawyers in Texas just adjust. They find parts of the tort law that they can excel in. And they're adjusting and adjusting. And when they adjust, they're leaving millions of wrongfully injured Texans without remedy. And we really have to pay attention to that adjustment problem because it comes with a terrific cost to people 
who are wrongfully injured and are left without representation. I want to thank all the presenters. Uh, I think they made mar marvelous presentations. It was live streamed around the country. We have the videos, which we hope to interest all kinds of educational and civic and professional organizations in seeing. I want to thank Real News Network uh, for uh, professionally producing these videos. That's Real News Network out of Baltimore. You should watch it. It's a very progressive television network, and you see things on it that you don't see on the commercial television or NPR or PBS. I want to thank our supporters. I want to thank uh, John Richard, uh, Todd Main, uh, Gene Stilp, and all their associates for uh, flawlessly uh, managing all of this and responding uh, to your needs. And just let me leave you with the final statement once again. If we are to have a democracy, as Judge Learned Hand said so famously, we must not ration justice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for being here. Thank you for staying. Just spread the word. Thank you. Thank you.